Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Why everything starts with biodiversity above and below ground and how one of the most advanced regenerative farmers in the Netherlands is setting up a fair farmers first marketplace to connect farmers with buyers of ecosystem services. Not just carbon removal, but biodiversity and water storage as well. It might not be the most sexy part of regenerative agriculture, but it's absolutely crucial. How do we pay farmers for all the other services they provide beyond the food, the fibers and the oil they, hopefully using regenerative practices, produce for us? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture. Investing as if the planet mattered. A podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another interview of investing in regenerative agriculture. Today with Jeroen Klompen, we're live. We haven't done too many interviews live actually in this series or in the in, in any of the podcasts. I'm very happy to do that because it always adds a bit, especially after lockdown to be able to not do this through a laptop. Jeroen Klompen is the co-founder of Klompen Landbau, Klompen Agriculture and Soil Heroes. And he's building with the team a farmer's first fair chain model to connect buyers of ecosystem services directly with farmers. They have the slogan, don't compensate, but regenerate. And full disclosure, I'm an advisor to Soil Heroes, and I'm very much looking forward. We've been talking about this interview, I think, for the last three, four years. I'm very much looking forward to learn more, fair chain, farmers first, compensate, don't compensate, but regenerate. So welcome, Jeroen. Thanks, Scott. And we're here at your farm, so we're going to hear some, probably some background noises of large machinery, etc., which is very suitable because obviously we're not in the studio. I know a bit of your background story, but I think it's absolutely fascinating to unpack that a bit. How did you end up running this farm just south of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, just situated a bit? It's raining outside. We're in July 2020. How did you end up running this farm? How did you end up on soil? It's actually, it's a family business. So I'm the fourth generation farmer at the moment. And the fifth generation is ready to step in in a couple of years. My background is in farmland management, farmland investment, and I was always busy with building business models on and around farmland. How can we make the best out of a plot which is available? And then you are going to look in a different way to soils. And you can look at it for let's let's build houses on it, but uh, you can also grow very beautiful food on it. And that was the starting point that we were going to start with uh, working with soil. And I'm working with soil now for 25 years now that uh, I've had a normal job for seven months. And then I became an entrepreneur and I still am an entrepreneur. And you took over the farm. You bought actually the family farm. We're here, like I said, just south of Rotterdam. Can you describe a bit the dimension? What should, as we're in audio, people cannot see where we are. What should we imagine when we talk about the family farm you're running at the moment? For Dutch circumstances, it's not a small farm and not a very big farm. We are operating at this moment on 350 hectares. And they are in a circle of, let's say, 10, 12 kilometers around the center of home. It's mostly divided into plots of 40 hectares. We are running a very diverse crop rotation. I think let's 60, 65% at this moment is in full transition to regenerative farming and the rest is still conventional but sustainable. 
And on the regenerative side, we have already fields which are in transition for eight years now. And so let's say eight, nine, ten years ago, was there one trigger? Was it a process? What was the trigger to how do you say, let's look different at soil? Because you've been farming, you've been in farming, but you didn't have this super focus on soil life, soil life, no, soil life. No, no, no. It actually started all with potatoes. That's probably a first in this podcast that somebody says that. Okay, explain. We were growing potatoes as one of the cash crops on this farm. And I had a vision to build a vertical short supply chain where we could deliver potatoes to families on a very short way, cutting out the middleman. And the big goal was that the children on the table would ask their mummies, oh, mom, can I get some extra potatoes because they are so extremely tasteful. That was my vision because... If it's tasteful, if it's full with nutrients, people are going to buy again and we can make a sustainable business model on it. And it's really demand driven. Yes, yeah. yes. Instead of calling, the opposite being called was my goal. And to achieve this, we're studying how a winery works. They have their own marketing, they have their own packing facilities, etc. So, what are the ingredients to do this? And then we learned, oh, you need to have a very good variety. Mm -hmm. You need to have very good soil. And you have to feed those plants on a very right way. And it sounds easy, but it is complicated. So in the end conclusion, it's all about building soil. If you have a healthy soil, you can grow healthy plants. And healthy plants provide you with healthy food. And what we've learned in the last years, if you have a healthy food with a lot of nutrients, it's extremely tasteful. So that was the starting point 10 years ago to start building soils. And therefore we needed to invest in our soils because you have the, the cooperation between the organic matter, with, between the soil biology and the nutrients, and they have to go working together. So we have to accelerate this whole system and this process. And that was not an easy way. You remember what was the first thing you did, like when you came to the realization, it's about soil life, I have to invest in my soils or in our soils. What was the first step? Because there are 5 million books, 10 million no, just, videos. Just, just the low hanging fruit, our organic matter level was low. So we were thinking, oh, we have to add compost because then we have a higher organic matter level and then it will flow and it will go working. No. You added compost, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Then we were thinking, oh, our soils are uh, compacted. So we were... a huge issue here in the Netherlands. Very huge issue. So we were going to decompact the soils. So we invested in CTF farming and also uh, kind of things. So what, what is CTF farming? So that all our crops are growing in unridden soil. Mm -hmm. So we are not compacting it. So there so is... You're always driving basically for anybody on, the, <laughs> on same, the same lanes. Yeah, same trend. So every year yeah, yeah. you only farm in between the lanes and you, yeah. you never drive on the fields that you're farming. Yes. And then we, we were, for example, examining the amount of food for the plants in the soil. Oh, it was too low. So we add extra nutrients to it. Still not working. And then we learned through all our journeys around the world. And my wife, she's an environmental scientist. So she, she knows also a little bit about how ecosystem service works, of how yeah, ecosystem so service systems work. You, we need soil biology. We need life in the soil. We need more life in the soil. And I'm imagining she probably was saying that for a long time and Maybe you were buying your fancy equipment and driving I on the same lanes, yes, you were not listening. I was not listening to that. I thought life, it, life, it, life, yes, biodiversity. It yeah. can all be solved with investing in a lot of machinery, but that's not true. It's about investing in a lot of employees in the soil, and that's called earthworms, bacteria, and fungi nowadays. So what's the... Because um, there's a lot there, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have your wife, Melanie, on the podcast at some point as well to really dive deep into that. So let me ask one question on that. What's the weirdest thing you've done to build life in your soil? Something you, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, you thought, I would never... The weirdest thing would be... Or the most surprising, maybe. The most, no, the most surprising thing is that we have started making our own mother cultures and biofertilizers on our farm to accelerate the biology in the soil. And that we could do that on our farm on a low cost base by just multiplying fungi and bacteria from a very old forest and it's just multiplying 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 and then adding the right nutrients to that and then fermenting this 
with compost extractions in it, with the mother culture in it, with milk, with yeast, etc. That's such a beautiful process, which is the 30 or 60 days process. And you can do that on your farm and you can use it for plant resilience or you can use it for increasing your biomass or you can make your own inoculants for the compost or the solid manure. That's amazing. So the fact that you could do that on the farm, you didn't have to buy a lot of no. fancy equipment, but you needed to learn how to do that. And just, I mean, I think many have, have maybe seen it on very small farms, but this is a massive 350 hectare farm, meaning you're doing this on a large scale. On a large scale. Yes. It's still small. It's not a factory, but it's definitely yeah. not a few pans and pots. And no, it's a small brewery yeah. within our farm. And I always explained on the right way, you have to listen to nature because nature has all the solutions for us. But we have lost connection with nature in the last 15, 50 years. And just how does nature solve those problems? What are the companion crops of a cash crop with a certain disease? How can they help each other? That's all a way of thinking. And it's just by adding those very strategic fungi in your biofertilizer, you can make the plants more resilient and diseases won't attack your crops. And it's the same with what Melnie has done with 800 kilometers of biodiversity lanes. Just introducing our natural enemies in our farms by combining nature and modern farming, there is balance again and there are, we don't have uh, problems with efforts anymore. What is a biodiversity lane, just for people that... We have written a computer program that we can calculate what is the most efficient part of the field where we can farm. We cash crop. Yeah. Cash crop. We are farming on that part and all the inefficient parts. So all the edges, all, all the, the edges, parts that you turn with the tractor yes. and the combine, but you don't, you don't really want to farm there. I mean, no. you're farming there in many European countries because you get <laughs> subsidies for every extra square meter you squeeze yeah. out, but you actually figured out it's not efficient to farm there, no. not effective at all. No. And you planted something else. Yes. And so we gave that back to nature. So we were sowing flower mixes, grass You didn't mixes. give it back. In a sense, it's not that you just left it and, no, and no, let's no, no. see what comes up. No, you very deliberately planted a mix of yeah. flowers, biodiversity, yes. plants that yes. that, attracts, a that That attracts bees, that attracts all the natural enemies of all the insects, etc. So on the island here, there are 800 kilometers yes. of biodiversity edges. Yes. And what has been the impact on, let's say, the fields nearby? It's extremely good for pollination. So all the crops we were growing, which depend on pollination, the yield has increased from the more moment. than the yield you took away from not planting there, because yes. that's obviously the next question. Yes. Well, okay, you plant a certain lane, a few, let's say, alongside the field, maybe one or two meters wide or one meter wide. You lose that. It wasn't the most effective piece anyway. No, but it also increased the yield of the yes. the cash crop yeah. zone. Yeah, there was a leverage effect. From the moment we started with the biodiversity lanes and the field margins, we have stopped using insecticides wow. immediately. And what we've learned is that they can fly 100 meters into the fields and do their job. So if you have a field of 200 meters wide, you need to, <laughs> you need on yeah. both sides, you need a biodiversity edge. And coming back to the biofertilizer. If you had to name one example of what has been the impact on the soil, what have you noticed over the last years for your main cash crops? As an example, did you have to irrigate less? Did you see better growth? What has been, the, apart from the fact that it's fun to make, much cheaper than buying a lot of biofertilizer, no. what has been the impact on the farming? What we are seeing after a couple of years is that the water holding capacity is increasing. So in dry periods, there is much more water available for the plants. So irrigation is going down. We can see that the depth of the roots is much deeper. We can see that the plants are stronger. They have a natural smile because they have more access to other micronutrients. Because so the fields feel better. Yes. It's funny because John Kemp always says the most advanced farmers, they walk into a field and they sense, they feel, they see something is off or something is going well. Yes. And you said these fields where you have been applying the right type of biofertilizer, homemade they sense, they seem, they feel better than, yes. than others. Yes. The plants are stronger. They're they smiling. have bigger stems and they have a, a natural color shining finish on their leaves. And that's... They seem healthy. healthy. Yeah. Yeah. They seem healthy. So water holding capacity is going well. Plant resilience is better. 
less irrigation, a little bit higher yields. And uh, we can see after eight years that the cost price is going down because we are rebuilding the battery of soils. And this sounds all amazing. You have your farm here. And actually, I'm going to let's stay with the brewery for a second because we actually have discussed one of the companies you're a part of in a previous podcast. I will definitely link it below, which is Tomasu with Bert, the soy sauce brewery. I think it is an example of your quest for searching for direct to consumer or director to consumer. You've done many things. We talked about the potatoes before. I know you've done others. Experiments, not all successful. Some yes, some not. How did, from the farmer perspective, and then we'll switch to the ecosystem services, how did the soy sauce happen? Because we heard the, the version of the soy sauce company, how they found you, but how did that happen? And why is that so interesting from a farm perspective to be in soy, in grain, in in taste, because that came back there very strongly. I had to think of that, obviously. What was the origin story from your side with the soy sauce company? Yes, I was searching for new, and as I'm always searching for new business models on soil to have a higher financial impact. And therefore, there was the upcoming movement of the green proteins. And we wanted to in the, have more diversity in our crop rotation. So we started growing legumes which are a nitrogen fixer for the soil. So it's good for the nitrogen balance of the farm. And we started with kidney beans, brown beans, and white beans. And on a natural flow, there came the soybeans also, because it's a product which is used on a large scale. So I was looking if we can make some plant-based dairy from that, or it was just a trial. How many years ago was this? Oh, it's six years ago, I guess. Before the whole movement really took off. Yeah. I mean, it was going... But the, was just the, the, the plant-based milks were yeah. didn't take over no, not the supermarket yet. yet. No, not yet. So, because soybeans have a, a lot of possibilities to provide products with it. So you can make milk of it, you can make soy sauce of it, you make, can make tofu of it. Lots of uh, possibilities. Yeah, fermentated, yeah. <laughs> we come back to the fermentation. Yes. <laughs> and we also saw a movement that there was a, lit, a big appetite for ancient grains and gluten-free grains. So therefore I went to a miller. Can you help me with milling my products and maybe we can connect to some customers. And that was the connection point where a strange baker visited the miller also. And I said, I, what you want is not mainstream yet. It's very niche and I don't know it yet, but I know someone. <laughs> two weeks ago, there was also a lunatic who wants to do something with grains and soybeans, etc. Maybe you can call each other. And that Luckily, was, he made the connection. Yes, and it was at this same place where we make also our plans for the whole Soil Heroes company. That in two hours, we decided to go working together and we have a successful brewery at the moment. And focused purely because the whole soil part wasn't part of the or origin story, purely on taste. That taste. was their quest. Yes. Taste, 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 taste. And then they discovered the nutrient part, the soil part, the farmer part, yeah. which I think, and it highlights something very important. You need a market for your products that yes. buy enough. So you cannot go, I mean, you cannot go with your potatoes and your onions to the farmer's market. It needs to buy enough and for a good margin. It's all about scarcity and it's all about decommoditizing your products. Which is a perfect bridge because you've worked for probably eight years in creating these markets for your products, your physical products that come off the farm that turn into french fries, that turn into soy sauce, etc. What was the moment, if you remember, if there was a moment, but that you started thinking, okay, these ecosystem services, not a nice name, but they sound interesting. Are there other markets that we as farmers that are on this journey, because you have been on a journey, are, are, should explore? Yes. It's a fact that we all are stuck in a system with commoditized food, where it's all about the cost price. We and not are, about the quality. Not about quality. And not about the taste. And not about well. the taste. Exactly. <laughs> and we also depend on, on the, we are in the highest end of the commodities, but it's still a commodity. So if you want to step out of the system, you have to build business models. So you can focus on the niche markets. We've done with the potato, we've done with the soy sauce, et cetera, et cetera. But then the niche markets are in development. And if you want to have... They're niche. They're by niche, definition. They're yeah. niche by definition. And it takes seven years to build up a company. So what we learned during our journeys around the world and during our practices for soil improvement, that if you are changing your mind and you start building soil again, that you are also going to provide a lot of beautiful things 
nature give us. So water holding capacity, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, stopping of erosion. Now, bio-based products, a lot of beautiful things soil can deliver us. Which are not food. Which are not food. And then just by reading the newspapers, what are the, the big problems of humanity? Now, we have a carbon problem. We have a sweet water problem. We have big problems with land degradation. We have big problems with erosion, with dust winds, etc. all around the world. So I was just thinking on a very easy way. If soil can deliver us such beautiful things, which is called nature, yeah. and we can see that there is a big, growing, extreme money-absorbing problem, if we can connect those things, then those services soil is delivering what we call ecosystem services now has value so if we can build a cycle of soil improvement for extreme good food which you can sell in a vertical supply chain with high nutrients and a beautiful taste and at the same time you can deliver ecosystem services in the way of water holding in the way of stopping erosion in the way of carbon sequestration or biodiversity that are the four big ones at the moment and you can sell them, you have extra income as a farmer to invest again in your soils. So, and then we have a positive spiral upwards. Because that's is, what you mentioned. You came to the realization, I need to invest in my soils, but there was no market or there no was money. no marketplace and no money willing to say, okay, Jeroen, great. You're going to store a lot of carbon, store a lot of water, restore a lot of biodiversity. Let me pay you for that yes. work very close to Rotterdam, very yeah. close to an enormous harbor that has an enormous environmental footprint. And about eight years ago, there was nobody able to say, okay, I can pay you for those services. I can pay you for the beauty. I can pay you for the erosion that's not happening. And you decided to start that market. What was that click? Because you could have gone, stayed here on the farm, continued your regenerative practices waited for somebody else to come and say, okay, I can sit here at the, the kitchen table and I can be the one selling for you those services. What was the switch to the entrepreneur saying, I will... It was a, a repeating process of, of voices in my head and in my body and from my heart, which were saying, this whole system is possible to realize. We can build soil. We can restore all the degraded farmland in the world by just using very natural practices and then we can deliver such beautiful things. So soil is a problem, but can be a huge solution. And all the dots were continuously connecting in my head. And that gave me the evidence and the trust in myself that we can do this and we can, we can help other farmers with such a system. So we can empower the farmers bottom up with a beautiful system that they are stronger in the market and that other farmers can also build business models on their soil. Which we is very different from, I can see this opportunity. I know a few of the recipes now, what, what works, what doesn't work. And I'm just going to expand my farm to 3000 hectares and be fine. No, I'm going to help other farmers, partner with other farms, empower other farmers, you just said. Why that empowerment? Uh, because in the essence, I am a farmer. I'm the son of a farming family and if I drive around, I can see every farmer stuck in a system. He's not happy in the system. He has to deal with the demands of the retail, etc., etc. And there are such more opportunities for them. And there is a big task of the farmers in the future to restore Mother Earth. And we can do that. So let's do that all together because then the impact is much, much bigger. And... Fortunately, I had the vision of that system in my head that if we can build a system which can monitor what is happening in the soil and if we can put it through a system where we can calculate the quantity of ecosystem services, then we are also able to monetize it and then we can hopefully start a market. So let's unpack that. What is, I mean, it's a very, very difficult, what is the system? What is Soil Heroes at the moment? We're talking the middle of 2020 and we'll talk about the vision as well, but what I'm a farmer somewhere in the Netherlands, somewhere in Germany, somewhere in the UK, somewhere in France. And I said, of course, I, I love the vision. What could Soil Heroes be to me? I have 50 hectares and I'm making my first steps, but I would love to go faster. What could Soil Heroes be to me? 
So Heroes is in the essence a platform where and that platform can help a farmer, giving them access to consumers or buyers, companies or governments or non-profits, etc., who have the willingness to pay for ecosystem services. And this platform is connecting those two parties on a very open and transparent way to make a peer-to-peer -peer deal. We can help the farmer with a recipe book, how to accelerate the soil improvement, and then we have a protocol of the steps he has to measure in his soil, starting with timestamp zero, so it's the beginning, and then he starts farming, we start the whole measuring and monitoring process, all those data is going into our models, in our calculation system, and then the quantity of ecosystem services, and we are focusing at this moment on water, biodiversity and carbon. Why those three? Because we've I mean, I've done the interview with Nori, which is purely carbon focused. With other people, it seems to be that everybody is going crazy for carbon. Why those three? Very good question. If you start improving the quality of soil, if you start building soils, you are not delivering, you are not only sequestering carbon. You need to improve your biodiversity. You need to improve the water holding capacity. So it's not about carbon only, it's about the whole approach of all the ecosystem services. And there are, I think, 12 or 14 different ecosystem services. So you're saying we're only focusing on three, but there are actually another 11 that we yes. use in the future. And they all have a big value. It's called the natural capital of society. You cannot say, oh, I do only the carbon... Oh, and you put a machine on your land to suck yes. the carbon. Yeah. And therefore, the whole vision of accelerating the soil improvement, then it's also about a basket of ecosystem services. So I can, as a customer, sorry, so I'm, I'm not the farm now, farmer, I will come back to that, but I'm a customer that wants to buy, because I'm, I'm buying the basket, I'm not buying the water because I'm a big fan of water, now I'm buying the full package. Yes. Because and otherwise you might create incentives for the farmer to only focus on, to more focus on the biodiversity or more focus, you, know, you want the full package. Okay, so as a farmer, I think, oh, that sounds amazing. You can connect me or you, you through the Soil Heroes Marketplace, I can connect with buyers. You mentioned the monitoring, T1, so it's not model-based, but it's what's ha really, happening really happening in my soils, on yeah. my soils, around my soils. How do you monitor that? Let's make one thing clear. We are not able to simulate all the things which are happening. We are working with the best universities at the moment to build models of what we think is happening in the soil and what is measurable. So based on what I can easily, cheaply measure and what we can imagine based on the best models, again, fed by more measurements yes. to figure out, okay, we think we probably are pretty sure that the biodiversity increased by X and yes. the water capacity. And then the next year you measure again and yes. the models become... So if we can see an improvement, we are adding ecosystem services. And just by calculating the reliability of what we are doing, and that's able that we do, we can make it transparent and we say, oh. So you're saying this basket has a reliability? Of 80% and then we sell the 80%. So that gives also question to other carbon in the market, which says, how sure are you? How sure are you? So we want to build a very open and transparent system, which is based on trust. And by being vulnerable in that, we can make it open and that people are checking it. It's also a possibility. It's not anonymous. A customer is connected to a farmer and a farmer needs to deliver because the consumer or the company is calculating with the offset of his carbon. He is going to use that in his annual report. So it's about real things happening. It's not paperwork. And does it mean there are Maybe you're not there yet, but in terms of there's trust, there's commitment, it has to be friendly, obviously, to use for the farmer. As a customer, I'm switching back to the customer. When I'm going to buy these baskets, do I need to put down a long-term commitment? Because I can imagine for the farmer, he or she would like to keep going. Is that a, a couple of years that I need to, like an offtake agreement? Or can I buy once? Or is that still in, in the process of figuring out? Because obviously you're building this as we speak. So there's... What, a, what, our vision is that we are not... There is a lot of compensating your carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And that we are not in a company... We strongly believe in a regenerative economy. Mm -hmm. So building soils again, and therefore we are selling the baskets. And 
by selling a basket of ecosystem services, you are restoring a certain amount of hectares. And so there it always is, come down to, comes down to, to, to hectares. And for example, the carbon component in it, the carbon part needs to be stored for at least 10 years. But it are annual deals, but we are building long-term relationships. And where are you now in terms of Soil Heroes? We're July 2020. As all startups, everything changes every two minutes. What is your current status? And let's say, then, then we'll go, what would you like to be at the end of the year? Yeah, the beautiful thing is that our charcoal drawing, which is made a couple of years ago, based on a large piece of paper is still there. It hasn't changed a lot. The core is for 100% still there. At this moment, we have built what we have launched an MVP, minimal viable product, where we can connect and onboard a farmer, where we can connect to a buyer and onboard a buyer and do on a minimum set of data, do the calculations and do for a the basket. Yeah, and do a transaction. For those three ecosystem services obviously yeah. not for the 14 or 12 no, no, but no, no. for the three core ones the three core ones okay and that's also one thing what we were focusing on a basket because in the end we think if we do this on the right way the carbon problem is there temporary so if we did it on a large scale we can solve the carbon problem by doing it all together but in the end it will be about sweet water and it will be about nutrients and even if the carbon, I mean, that's, I love the argument because even if the carbon problem tomorrow morning would go away, the issue with a lot of the sector of regenerative agriculture and food is that we would sort of lose the only argument we had, like it has to be carbon, 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 but actually carbon is it's, a small it, part of a much bigger story that if tomorrow carbon, carbon disappears as a problem or disappears is, as an overflow, because we're, if we're filling up the bathtub, doesn't mean we shouldn't transition away from coal, etc. but even if that would be fixed tomorrow morning, we'd still be in a lot of trouble on the nutrient side, on the sweet yes. water, drinking water, yeah. on healthcare, on a lot biodiversity, yes. a lot of other things. Starting with biodiversity, biodiversity gave us nutrients. And that gave you your biodiversity in your soil, gave you your soils back. Yes, that's, that's all about. And carbon is just a side effect. Because it went up, because that was the interesting, you said I put a lot of compost, didn't change anything. No. But life back in the soil, and you're storing carbon. Yes. So that's, I think it's... Nature is a holistic system with all the small ingredients. And if you put one thing out, there is... Reductionist thing. Yes, and there is unbalance and it's not working very good anymore. So you're now at the MVP, you're able to connect... We are beyond the MVP at the moment. Like the first customer with yes. the first... Uh, the first farmer with the first customer. Is that something that by the end of the year you would love to have a few of those? We are, at this moment, we want to connect to front runners front runner farmers on the regenerative side who have a clear vision who wants to build soil who wants Just to build vertical supply and who want to build business models who also wants to be an inspiring source for other farmers so because what we are doing is not visible on a short-term base on a long-term base it's extremely visible because you see the worms you can see the bacteria after you can see life in soil you can see all the insects and the birds etc that, that's on the long term but on the short term it's not visible therefore we need places where you can be inspired and see so we want to onboard those farmers uh, in europe some, geography wise where are you looking for if people want to uh, the ambition can be big but the, we must be realistic and that we are focusing on Europe at the moment because we are able to build the models for those all types, those climate circumstances and this kind of land use. Yeah. And it's easy to translate it to Africa or Australia, but it takes time and you need a team to build it. So yeah. first, here, okay, yeah, we start in Europe. So you're looking for a number of front runner farmers and I can manage a number of front runner companies, buyers, buyers yes. NGOs, non yes. whatever, whoever wants to buy the baskets. Yes, who wants to change their business into a business for good, a purpose-driven companies and not a profit for a purpose, but a profit through purpose. And, that's and that means you're looking for food companies or in the food space that also want to change their ingredients, change their farm grades, or you're looking for the harbor of Rotterdam that wants to regenerate and not compensate. Yes, both. if we want to inspire a bigger community, we are focusing on different sectors. It can be uh, fashion, it can be natural cosmetics and home and healthcare, it can be food, but it can be also companies who have a connection 
with their natural sources from the earth. So making a tree of uh, 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 furniture, yeah. furniture or papers or something like that, who have a connection with soil. Launching customers and yes. launching farmers. That's the phase you're yes. now in, which is very exciting. But It's extremely exciting. Yeah. But then, And then the end, we can hopefully bring back nature to the balance sheet because we have lost the connection. And it was interesting when you mentioned it's not visible or not tangible, obviously very different from all the short supply chain work you've done because it was very tangible because you were making the products from the potato, you were, are still making the soy sauce, etc. Why? Because it's not a very sexy subject, ecosystem services, marketplaces. I mean, just a word already. Um, what convinced you or what triggered you? I mean, you saw it for your own farm, you see it for others. Why? focus on the market of something so intangible or so not visible. I love to ask the question to see your way of thinking of, or to see the ways of thinking of guests, because I'm very interested in the ITN framework. So the importance, tractability, solvability, and neglectedness, meaning this is a very important problem to like, what would happen if we fix this? Would the world be a lot better or not? Importance. Is it solvable? Is it doable? And can we track that sort of? And is it mostly ignored? And I think somehow this ecosystem services, at least to me, but obviously you're building a company in that, it ticks all the boxes. Like it's huge. If we can pay farmers for, if there's a market, I think I would love to hear a bit more on that. It's doable because we see it all around the world that despite all odds, actually farmers are doing this. And it seems mostly neglected because people talk a lot about carbon. There's some offset, but it's a small market and very opaque. What do you see, let's say, tackle the most... Do you see that there's a market for these baskets? Because at the end of the day, it's just like your potatoes. You need to have somebody buying these. We can have all the farmers in the world. I think finding the farmers is not going to be the trickiest part. What it needs the market, it needs the customers to buy these baskets. What has been your experience over the last years there in terms of demand, interest, understanding of complexity, baskets, thinking? Um, it's a very long question. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> The first thing, is it solvable? Yes, it's solvable. We can solve a lot of problems and we can solve, we don't have a food problem. We have a nutrient problem and we have a distribution problem. So it's already proven that we can grow very healthy food in the desert. So if the world population is growing so fast, we are still able to feed them. Maybe we have to eat a little bit less meat because a lot of the crops which we're growing at the moment is for cattle feed. So that problem is done. Doesn't mean it's easy. Um, Turning around a farm in this current system anywhere in the world is difficult, but it's, it's difficult. possible. It's, it's, it's possible. Okay. So importance. Is it important? We talked about that. It's, it's extremely fundamental, important. even if we take yes. out the carbon part. Yes. Is it neglected? Like are a lot of people focusing and working on this? Not yet, but you see, if you look at the awareness of the last two years in all the news uh, at the moment, about biodiversity, for example, about uh, very good research papers that biodiversity must be part of the business models. Otherwise, we don't have a produce anymore in the future. That's, so it's not a nice to have, it's an absolutely key to have. It's if you don't have biodiversity have. above and in your soil. We are all connected. It all starts with nature from the earth. And if we, as a collective, decide to continue destroying it, that's also a decision. But then we know it's going to end somewhere in the future. And there is a growing group of consumers and companies who feel and see the vision that we have to do something back for all the things we took from the earth to restore and make the whole economic systems more in balance. And they see that also as a new way, a new license to produce for the future. Meaning that to, to answer the question of there is interest, there is potential demand, there is the demand side of these, this basket of ecosystem services, not just I want carbon or I want water, but it's growing. you see it's, it's, a change it's, over the last years yes. since you've been diving yes. very deep into this, obviously. Yes, and uh, it's the front run runners where, where we are focusing on uh, at this moment, but they see that they can bind their community of their buyers by doing good, by doing something back, by implementing it in their whole business model, by being carbon or uh, planet neutral or maybe planet positive. And if you see the other movement in the true cost accounting, which we totally have forgotten in the last 20 years, 
it's still there. We just it's, kept, it's a kept com- taking it's, it's like a it's a common a bank problem. Yeah. And there is a growing group also of, of activists and, and shareholders and investors who are going to ask questions. The public media is going to ask questions. And we need to prepare ourselves as companies, as consumers, to have the answers for that. And there is a big opportunity in those markets. And if you calculate the value of this market, it's huge, but it's, we're still in the beginning. Sorry. And we have to imagine if we are five years further on the road, what's happening then? What would happen then in your vision, five years down the line, so 25? It would be normal to talk about bringing back nature on your balance sheet. And it can be an asset, so it, because it has a value, then you can put it on the balance sheet and it's not out of pocket money anymore. It's not a nice to have, it's a key to have, especially, I mean, I, I always say, especially in food, but actually in food, fiber, oils, every fashion, every, almost everything we wear, eat, breathe comes out of the soil, either very deep or slightly more up. And, and we completely lost that connection. And, and there's also a social imbalance. Of and, and you countryside should, city. Yes, you're solving that workers. problem. Also. That, uh, and so you're in the, that process. So if we would talk in a year from now, like say 12 months later, we'll probably be able to talk about a number of these deals. The, yes. the first front runner farmers connected to the first front runner companies, brands, etc. And we'll be seeing some of those exciting ones. We'll definitely check in. We have, we have more data then. And therefore we also have the Soul Heroes Foundation, which is run by Melanie that we can tell what what has happened on those farms we can tell the the deals we've made and hopefully that's a big source of inspiration that this new industry nature inclusive industry is going to evolve and now we're talking about big yeah yeah, i know big picture but i think if we're such at the beginning if we don't dream big then yeah we're, we're we're doomed anyway so to end with a few questions that I like to ask in general, and I know you have some thoughts about this. So you're, for now, let's say for a few years, uh, no longer the co-founder of So Heroes, they, they run by themselves, but you're in charge of a $1 billion investment fund. And you come a bit from the world of investing, so I'm expecting some interesting answers. <laughs> what would you, how would you put that money to work? Yeah, what we see is that transition finance is a hot topic at the moment because you have to help farmers to go through the starting phase because there is a little bit unawareness uh, things go wrong the market is not there fully etc cetera, etc cetera. you have to build soils a little bit first before you can deliver the ecosystem service so there is a, a startup phase in building soil so there are if we can run a 1 billion farm inf- uh, investment fund i said there could be a could few, be farmland. There could be anything else. It, if you want to invest yes. it all in soy sauce, there are, there are that's big, also possible. There, yes, there are big, uh, a few big gaps at the moment where we can focus on. It's about spreading your risk also, but it's not one thing. It's about, you can invest in, in the real assets, in degraded farmland, restoring it, make it available for farmers to grow or expand their farms. It's a very good thing to invest in. And it's a big problem also. The other thing is we can help accelerating the ecosystem service market by investing in soil impact bonds. So it's a performance agreement that you are going to deliver those amount of of, uh, ecosystem service, but you get paid in advance. That's also a way of transition finance for the farms. But that means, because they're not there yet, you probably would invest in actually setting up the first outcome-based payment scheme to make sure that That market... That's not so complicated and... Uh, it can, but still, it's not It's not that you can decide tomorrow, okay, I have 200 million, I want to invest them all in no, these no, no, outcome-based it, products because they're not there, you have to develop them, but it's an investment, yes, which is... It's, and if you have an investment fund, it's, all, it's about building business models mm-hmm. also, because then the value of your money is going to increase. The other thing is just helping them with transition loans uh, in a very creative way. I have my vision about it, not just a normal loan, but it can be a very creative one that you have that your noses are in the same direction, not from a banking perspective. Partnering with farmers, skin in the game. Yes. And the fourth big thing is we have a food system at the moment, but by helping companies who wants to build a different way of making food and therefore they need the products from the land, it's an extremely interesting growing area where it's about nutrients in the end. 
where it's about taste in the end and related to what's happening at the moment where we have a food system where we uh, fill the people and not feed the people and that's market opportunity is huge and by building those rather small vertical supply chains it's which is interesting because you you have quite a bit of experience with that and most of them didn't work out that well but a few did so you would definitely invest in more some of that investment fund would be put into let's say the next generation food companies that yes, are building definitely. food as medicine nutrient density definitely. definitely because let's say the taste of the soy sauce is asking for more of those and the are there any products or not products but let's say oh i would love for you, you said uh, i would this is a product category i would focus on would it be grains would it be potatoes would it be livestock is, is there anything that if somebody would be building a company, it would be super... I mean, it all has to be rebuilt, but at, at this moment, what, we, what excites you? What excites me at the most at this moment is the crops a farmer needs to grow to improve the quality of soil, mm-hmm. but which have the lowest profitability. So It's if not we, the first time this comes on the podcast. That's very interesting. Yeah. So the, basically buying the whole rotation, but not the cash. Crop. Like how can you... For example, on our farm, we are growing wheat, but, but we are not earning money on it because we need the wheat to increase the quality of soil. So it's, it's a rest crop. It's an investment. It's a loss. It's yes. Yes. only so costs you money. If we can make this crop more profitable by connecting it to very interesting business models, then we are not depending anymore on those very big cash crops which are extremely intensive, uh, negative intensity for the soil. And that's, it's all about balancing. Figuring out how to make sure you can sell the full rotation and all the crops that normally I would either would go to animal feed or would just be yes. cut in and plowed yes. into the soil. So if we can grow a super grain, which is the highest nutrient content and that you can recover uh, very quickly after because the proteins are so good after a hospital visit or something, but maybe it's so good that you don't need to go to the hospital anymore in the end. Yeah. Okay, so we take your investor head away, unfortunately, but you have the magic power to change one thing in the agriculture and food system industry overnight. So there's one, if, if one thing you would change, would it be everybody has a nutrient density meter? Would it be everybody's focus on taste or all farmers are counting rain? If, if we, what would be your magic? You have one shot. If Don't we ask have, for two, but one, if, what is your one shot? Have, if we have a nutrient passport with all the food we are growing and, and providing. Uh, we meaning the farmer or the consumer? Or as society? As a society. That, uh, because that brings us the awareness. And then at the end, we all know that the healthcare costs are rising enormously fast. And it, at the end, it, it will be all about nutrients. When did you realize that? Ah, oh, that's not such a long period ago. It's also it's it's about reading. It's a process. It's a process. It's it's but it, reading a book, talking to people who are busy on this. For example, Dan Barber, who is has a vision about the connection between taste and uh, nutrients. It's also about growing some ancient grains and see that they won't become sick. So there has been an evolution of the seed where the seeds are not so strong anymore that they can protect themselves against fungi and bacteria. And when you look at, at any ancient grains of six, seven hundred years ago, they are still green on the field. And what excites you about that? Because it, it, the yield is a lot that, lower, that but it's that, a whole different That means that, that nature had the possibility to grow a grain that doesn't get sick. Yes. And, and we lost that. Yes. And just to bring it full circle, I mentioned that the intro a fair model, a fair chain model, what you're building with Soil Heroes, what is fair about the model? Um, and why that specific? Because you very consciously put that in the slogan. The fairness is that it, it's open and transparent. Uh, Which is something that the agriculture world is not. <laughs> no. Uh, so you want to decommodify an ecosystem service market. Also, you have a peer-to-peer deal and we are only, uh, we are a service company uh, to, to that just for a fee. And so the market is going to develop and the, the farmers get paid for it. And by building a short supply chain in the niche market, you are able to divide your food dollar or euro in your supply chain on an equal basis. So because mm-hmm. I strongly believe if you have 
a system of a farmer which is very talented in growing food then you have a processor and a marketeer and if you can work together in your own talented to build this supply chain from farmland to consumer and you decide oh we depends on each other's okay. talent we can also share each food on your door on a fair way instead of the brands taking most of the or the supermarkets yeah and if there would be one thing you believe to be true about agriculture that or regenerative agriculture as well that others don't what would that be this question is definitely inspired by john kemp who usually asks it in a slightly different way what do you believe i have an idea but what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that, that others don't i strongly believe that it is working it's a system in balance which is working and which is improving itself and by answering that you you are saying that most people still don't or don't believe that it's there possible a, and working there is a big hesitance because we are in a world where we have been grown up and educated in in a more industrialized cost price driven way of farming but even when you bring your neighbors other farmers to your farm you show what has changed what is happening because you can show it very nicely as you have some fields that have been in this transition for eight years some recently joined the family and are much shorter yes. is it still difficult because to see because you can touch you can feel you can taste you and there, you and can there's share always the numbers. between if you have two mountains and there's a big valley in between you have to have the guts to step to from jump. yes to jump from this side to the other side and there's a lot of social influence around it influence of the whole industry around us that uh, and you're saying that paying for ecosystem services however unsexy that might sound could help more farmers to take that jump absolutely because in the end if you are getting empowered bottom up with extra money extra business models extra income every farmer wants to have an extra income and they are all working with the big, biggest assets that soil and no you don't want to you yeah. don't want to spoil destroy. that you don't want to destroy that but you are forced to do that because you are in a cost price driven system every farmer wants to step out but is blocked so far most of them yes and that can be by by banks it can be by your long term contracts it, it can be by all possible agronomists yes your neighbors yes with that i don't think we could have wished for a better end of the interview thank you so much Owen i don't think it's the last time we'll be talking about this I'm looking forward and I wish you all the good luck of closing the first or enabling the first contracts to flow through the system and the first money to flow to the farmers and the first baskets no, we have, to flow we, the other side. We have signed the first contracts this week so we are very happy and looking forward in a positive way to the six months next six months. Thank Thanks you so a much. lot. Thanks a lot. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, 
permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.